welcome to the day that we get to reflect on the Desert Fathers. We are here in this beautiful valley, or what we call here in the Holy Land, a wadi. And you can hear, I hope you can hear the water behind me. And we are in the wadi where a monastery was built. It's called the Monastery of St. Saba. This is one of the three oldest monasteries in the entire world and was built by the Desert Father named Saba. And the, the brook that you hear behind me, this water that you hear behind me flowing, actually comes from this area and goes all the way down into Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, it used to flow through what was the Kidron Valley. It's the Kidron Brook. And now that uh, water, as it goes through Jerusalem, is in pipes, and so we don't get to hear it in Jerusalem. But this is the same water, the same brook that, as we remember in our own Christian faith, Jesus passed over that uh, brook many times, and particularly we remember on Holy Thursday when he went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane and then was arrested and was taken back over the brook. And any Galilean or any pilgrim who is coming from the north to Jerusalem would always probably have to cross this brook because they would come over the Mount of Olives. And so this is, was, you know, the water that flows through the valley on the eastern side of the temple. And so that gives us kind of an understanding of where this monastery is located. In fact, if you ever want to come here, they have a new observation point on the other side of the valley, and you can see the monastery right in front. But we decided to come to the place where you actually are on the side where you can enter the monastery. Um, it follows the old practice because it was founded in really the late 400s, um, early 500s. And so a monastery for men was a place where only men enter. They do have a place where women can come in as well. It's called the Women's Tower, but that's as far as we can go. And you have to come either on, well, any day that's not a Wednesday or a Friday because those are fasting days. And so this beautiful place, this striking place, really this time of year is more green than it usually is. But we are in the middle of the desert and we want to listen to the desert fathers. So St. Saba, who was he and how did he end up here? Because he's not from Bethlehem or Betzahur. This we're right. We have to go through those areas to be able to make it to this monastery. Well, he was actually a, uh, an eight or nine year old, I think, when his um, father, who was in the military, was off on his duties. And so he was sent to be educated in a monastery in Turkey. He's actually from a place called uh, Caesarea Cappadocia in, or Cappadocia in Turkey. And so when he was there, he grew up and was a very bright student. We have to remember at that time, if you were going to receive an education in virtue, you would go to a monastery. You can read a little bit about the Western monastic tradition, meaning um, St. Benedict and everything that he did for Western civilization and also education. Also in that area of Cappadocia, where St. Saba went as a young boy, he went to study and to grow, really to grow into a man and into virtue. So as soon as St. Saba was older in his teens, his family did ask for him to come back and be married because he was from a, a well-off family. But he insisted on staying and becoming a monk. I don't know if they were pleased with it or not, but he did insist and he began to live a life well, continue living a life of great virtue. In fact, he stood out, even as a young man, as being rather pious. Because in places like this, I hope you can make out behind me, you know, there's hermitages in caves all along this wadi. And it's just incredible to see them. You just see an opening, you see a built up wall, you might see a garden that's cultivated. We've seen that in the deserts we've been traveling through during our pilgrimage. And so it's only when you're an older monk that they say that you're mature enough to be able to live more of a hermitage life or semi-hermitical life. And usually that doesn't happen when you're so young. But they say that he was um, so inclined to wanting to have space for silence and prayer alone that he would work all day long. And then he would stay up at night, most of the night, praying. And so eventually he was able to live uh, a life of a hermit, but he as most of the desert monks, don't do this on their own. He looked for a desert father or a desert mother. These aren't people generally who are ordained if they're men or who have any special, um, you know, calling, or really they do have a calling, but they don't have a special, I would say, ceremony to send them out or as, as a father or a mother of the faith. Rather, 
they really are responding to the Holy Spirit who's doing something inside and is bringing them to become a point of reference for younger people who feel the same way. So he looked for a, a, a desert father or a, you know, a guide, and he ended up going from Turkey all the way here to Palestine. And one of the places he ended up, uh, if you've been here and you've gone to the Dead Sea or if you've gone to the baptismal site of the Lord, he went to a place called St. Gerasimus. So in the middle of the desert on the highway to get to either of these places, you see a golden dome out there in the middle of the sand. And that is the place where St. Gerasimus lived at the same time. And so St. Saba went over there and he learned from this very wise hermit. And while he was there, he grew in prayer, he grew in sanctity. And just like we're doing during this Lent, he heard, he was listening to a call. It was almost like a spiritual burning bush. You know, Moses heard from the burning bush in Sinai. Well, St. Saba heard the voice of the Lord within his heart. He heard, looking out at the desert, that the Lord was calling him to something more. And when that happened, he decided to, okay, go out of his comfort zone in a way, in Jericho. There were 150 men who wanted to follow him. And so that's when he came here. And this remote place, even today quite remote, to start a monastery. What makes St. Saba Monastery so unique is not only that, like I said, it's one of the oldest monasteries in the world, as well as St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai that we saw earlier. This monastery has never been uninhabited. There have always been monks there. There are monks there right now. And so what he started 1,500 years ago, a little bit more than that, is continuing. He's continuing. It's as he planted that tree that's bearing great fruit. So, Oh, one of the things I did want to mention about his life as well is he wasn't disconnected from the things of the world. You might think that contemplative monks or nuns or monks out here who spend, usually if they're hermits, at least five or six days in the hermitages, praying, fasting, certainly not eating anything wonderful, working. They come together usually once a week in what is called a lavra. Now, St. Saba started the lavra. Lavra is just a word that means, literally, it means a hallway. And so a lavra is just a grouping of cells or different um, caves or rooms uh, around a certain um, central area. And many times if you're going to build, I mean, imagine if you're going to build a monastery down here. You can see the annex to the monastery right behind me. It's right against a cliff face. So, of course, it's going to be a hallway. And so it's only once a week that they come together to celebrate the liturgy. They raise their voices together in praise to God and they'll share a common meal and then they'll go back to their hermitages. And so also what I love about this place is you can see the ravens flying above us. And remember, we saw where Elijah was on Mount Sinai. He was the same. He, like the, pro the uh, prophets in the Old Testament, they also lived like this. And Elijah was fed by the uh, ravens bringing him bread, right? So there's something, there's something about the desert so even they're, they're here, they're not disconnected from the world in the sense that uh, the example of St. Saba, when his parents passed away, he did receive an inheritance. And so what he did with that money is he started actually two hospitals for people who were needy. And then another thing that he did, because he was so in tune with the church, is he went three different times to the capital of the Byzantine Empire, which was that time, to speak with the emperor to help fight off the heresies after the Council of Chalcedon, saying that what was proclaimed there is the truth and other people are saying things that are actually heretical, they're actually damaging people. Why was he listened to? He didn't have anything. He lived in the middle of nowhere. He was listened to because he knew how to listen to the Lord. And that brings us again to why we're spending some time with the Desert Fathers. Why do we come to the desert? Why in Lent do we call this a time of walking through the desert? What's the point? And even going to the bigger um, context of our pilgrimage, why did the Lord have the chosen people 40 years in the desert? Oh, they didn't obey him. They, they didn't listen to his voice, the golden calf, all that stuff. There's more. The desert is a place where we can always begin anew because we can listen. 
And the desert is a place where there's an essentialness. You know, there's something in life which I don't have all the extras. And so I, I'm able to listen better. And then I'm able to do more. And when I can listen better to the Lord, the wisdom comes. And then the impact I can have on the world is immense. Because it's a little, it's like almost a concentration of the grace of the Lord coming in and just being, you know, spread out through all the world because of the wisdom and the love, the faith, hope, and love that's in the souls of these people. So I think the Lord had the chosen people through the desert for a number of reasons. And one of those is so that they could always learn that we need to begin again and again and again. Every day of those 40 years was a new beginning for the people of Israel. When they come into the promised land, it's a new beginning. The Israelites had to form an entire nation. How did they know how to persevere? The desert. When we live desert experiences, we can persevere and we can hear the Lord and we'll be in that sense, spiritually mature, happy, profoundly fulfilled. And that's what the Lord wants. So as you know, we've been reading the wisdom of the desert fathers. And so I wanted to make some reference to some of those people who came after Saint Saba. There's not a lot of writing that he left, even though he was very well educated, but there's a lot of things that people wrote about him. And what he established, especially here in the monastery of Saint Saba, and by the way, underneath a beautiful, um, well, very, you know, dome that you can tell, there's a church there where we have his relics with us right now. And so today we actually asked the intercession of Saint Saba as we came out here with all of you or for all of you so you can see this place. And those relics were actually taken away from this monastery. And I think it was in the time of the Crusades, probably to protect them once the Crusader Kingdom fell. And it was actually Saint uh, Pope Paul VI who brought them back so that they can rest in the place where he was buried originally. So what is some of the wisdom that he taught the monks around him and that was, was taught to monks after him? Well, again, I want to focus on this particular aspect this week, and that is beginning again. What is the beginner's heart? We're going to read a couple of gems of wisdom and then we'll have a commentary. We talked about Abba Poman when we were in the Valley of the Kings looking at that hermitage behind us. So what does he say about beginning anew this invitation of the desert? He says, Abba Poman, it's written, said about Abba Prior that every single day he made a fresh beginning. And then there's another desert father named Silvanus. And he writes, Abba Moses asked Abba Silvanus, can a man, can a man lay a new foundation every day? The old man said, if he works hard, he can lay a new foundation at every moment. As you know, there's also the desert mothers. Uh, in the desert fathers and mothers, um, it didn't matter who you were, what sex you were, if you were called to lead, then you went out and people gathered around you. So there's a, a desert mother named Theodora. And she also writes about this and she says this. She said that neither asceticism nor vigils of any kind of suffering are able to save. Only true humility can do that. There was an anchorite who was able to banish demons, it said. And he asked them, the demons, what makes you go away? Is it fasting? The demons replied, we do not eat or drink. Well, is it vigils? They replied, we do not sleep. Is it separation from the world? We live in the deserts. What power sends you away then? They said, Nothing can overcome us, but only humility. So Theodora says, do you see how humility is victorious over demons? So when we're talking about beginning again and again, what does it mean? That we become vulnerable and humble and in need. It's not, as you look out here, the asceticism, the vigils, the fasts, all the sacrifice, the lack of sleep, none of that. Not even coming to the desert. <laughs> they live there. It is humility. And one of the best examples of this, I just want to read 
from Anthony the Great, Anthony of the Desert that we spoke about, St. Anthony of Egypt. And this is what he wrote regarding beginning again and the desert. He says this, One day some old men came to see Abba Anthony. In the midst of them was Abba Joseph. Wanting to test them, the old man, meaning Abba Anthony, or the old man who came to see Abba Anthony, suggested a text from the scriptures. And beginning with the youngest, he asked them what it meant. Each gave his opinion as he was able. But to each the old man said, You have not understood it. Last of all, he said to Abba Joseph, How would you explain this saying from scripture? And he replied, I do not know. Then Abba Anthony said, Indeed, Abba Joseph has found the way, for he has said, I do not know. This helps us to understand that the desert monks tried to practice the beginner's mind. That's the little rule for beginners in St. Benedict's rule. He actually writes, always we begin again. The desert monks invite us again and again to commit to our spiritual practice and path. And this is the essence of humility to remember that we are always beginning in the spiritual life. The moment we think we have it all figured out or that we understand, the further we are from the spiritual path. Humility demands that we always come to our journey with a spirit of openness, knowing that there is always more to learn. On the other hand, when we think we have fallen away too far to return, we actually may be doomed to never try at all. So the path of humility is about holding these two dimensions in balance, being open to always discovering more and always beginning again when we stumble and fall. When we reject both of these, we have lost our way completely. We have to remember that it is at the very times that we want to quit our spiritual practice when we're plagued with boredom or dissatisfaction and manage to work through them, that we find the essence of what the desert fathers and mothers were talking about. We recommit ourselves. We begin again. In the wisdom of the desert, Merton wrote, there are only three stages to this work. To be a beginner, to be more of a beginner, and to be only a beginner. Thank you so much for joining us here in this incredible desert. So know that we're praying for you from the Holy Land as we continue our journey through this place and we continue to begin again and again and again with great humility so the Lord can work in us and through us. God bless you and we hope to see you again tomorrow.